All right, so we move into kind of the last phase of our discussions here in chapter five, and that is talking about fires. Now, when it comes to fires, there are five different classes of fires, and they're all alphabetical in terms of their designations, A, B, C, D, and K. Now, for class A fires, class A fires are kind of the normal fire. These are the ones that we commonly see in houses. Uh, so if a house catches on fire, it's usually class A materials that are catching on fire. These are things like wood, paper, clothing, fabric, plastics, rubbers, those kinds of things. Pretty much class A fires are common combustibles, common household goods. As we progress up the ranks, we will come across other kinds of fires, and this moves us into Class B. So Class A, common fire, um, common combustible materials. Class B are your flammable liquids. So we would have in here things like diesel fuel, gasoline, home heating oil, oil-based paints, but also flammable gases, things like hydrogen gas, compressed liquid propane, kerosene, liquefied petroleum gases, alcohols, common workbench solvents like um, ethers or lacquers. So if it's a flammable liquid or a flammable gas, it's going to qualify under class B. Class C fires are electrical fires. So these are fires associated with faulty wiring, with fuses, switches, any kind of uh, electrical equipment. So if a uh, fire is caused by a short in your toaster oven, that would be an electrical fire. That's a class C fire. But they can also involve things like electric motors and generators as well. But most often it is faulty fuse boxes, faulty wiring, old electrical equipment that shorts out, those kinds of things. So it might happen in a lot of cases when we see, you know, big fires that start in uh, home or industrial areas, they might be started by a class C, by an electrical short. And then as that fire spreads, it goes in, it grabs all of the building material and starts to ignite the wood, the, the building material, the fiberglass, whatever is in the house and becomes a class A and a class C fire at the same time. Class D fires involve combustible metals. So here we are usually talking about powdered metals or metal shavings. So in here, we have things like aluminum metal shavings. Um, we have things like metallic sodium, metallic magnesium. Um, any of those kinds of powders or even just fine shavings. Uh, I know most of you guys are in here are, are welding. Um, these are the kinds of things that you can see, you know, if you're grinding on certain kinds of metals and you get the fine sparks that are flying off of those. Um, if you're not careful, if you get a whole big pile of shavings coming up as you're doing your work, that has the potential to cause a flash fire um, because of the heat generated by that friction. Um, so uh, a lot of these kinds of things can happen in an accidental kind of setting. Um, when we're just not paying close enough attention to what we're doing. But those are class D fires. So we've covered the A, the B, the C, and the D. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are we going from D to K? Doesn't seem to make a ton of sense. 
until we figure out what K is. K is a kitchen fire, class K for kitchen. And in particular, we're talking about things like animal fat, greases, vegetable oils, things that are associated with commercial fryers, restaurants, cafeterias, catering, um, fires that can start inside of pans. So, you know, you cook up some bacon and the bacon gets too hot and the grease starts to smolder and, and um, eventually catches on fire. That is a class K fire. Now on the small scale in your home, you can usually put out class K fires just by smothering them in some kind of way. Put a pot lid on top of it, cover it in salt or baking soda to basically wipe out the, the, uh, the effects of the, uh, to block it out from oxygen. Baking soda is usually a decent choice because um, as baking soda heats up, it often will decompose into carbon dioxide, which kind of has a secondary helper. But in large scale kitchen fires, um, anybody here ever work in fast food, work in a restaurant? All right, me too. Put myself for, through the first two years of college working weekends at Wendy's. It was not a, exactly a fun thing to do. That was an important thing because I needed the money. And that's exactly what it was, was uh, we went through training and it was basically, okay, if a, if a fryer catches on fire, this is what's going to happen. And they'd show this big elaborate video and they'd show, you know, a uh, uh, fryer engulfed in flames and um, these little nozzles shooting this combination of chemicals onto the fire and putting the fire out almost instantaneously. That's how it works in most restaurants. Um, that's the system that is in place in most cases because, well, kitchen fires have to be handled a little bit differently. So those are our five classes of fires. Again, A, common household goods. B, flammable liquids and gases. C, electrical. D, metal. K, kitchen, oils and fats. Now we know our different types of fires. Now we can get into how do we actually put those fires out. And so for most cases, you know, the thing that we think of the most often when it comes to putting out large fires is using water. Now, when it comes to fire extinguishing, we need to go back and look at our flame tetrahedron. Remember, all four of those things need to be present in order for the reaction to continue, in order for the fire to continue. The aim of any fire extinguisher is to knock out at least one of those legs. If we knock out at least one of those legs, the fire will basically start to stuff itself out. Kind of like a chair. These chairs have four legs on them. You're sitting on a chair of four legs right now. If I take a saw and knock off one of the legs of that chair, you're not going to be able to sit in it very comfortably. It's the same kind of thing. The fire tetrahedron has to have all four of these elements. So when we look at fire extinguishers, they're going to work to try to knock out one or more of the elements. And when it comes to water, water is actually going to try to do two of them at once. Water is probably best at fire extinguishing because it has a very high heat capacity. What that means is that as water is added, it takes a lot of energy to raise water's temperature, and it takes even more energy for water to then boil or evaporate into the gas phase, both of which happen during a firefighting kind of event. So as a result, water ends up pulling tons of energy out of the fire as it's being applied. And that knocks out the heat 
aspect of the flame tetrahedron. Now, at the same time, if we put enough water on it, we also start to choke out its ability to access its oxidizer. And so by blocking its access to oxygen as it is going through this transformation, we will see that it's going to try and knock out that second leg as well. But its primary use is as a heat capacitor. We add that water, the water absorbs all the heat, and it makes it so that the fire starts to cool down. And if we get it to cool down enough, it doesn't vaporize the fuel nearly as quickly as it needs to, the fire goes out. Now, the problem with water is that those fire hoses dump a ton of water all at once. Oftentimes, way more water than what actually can be used to properly absorb all the heat at once. And so what happens is we end up getting a ton of water that just ends up sitting at the site. It really never absorbs any of the heat. So one of the ways that they combat that is through the use of fog nozzles or sprayers or misters where it delivers less water, but the water gets used more efficiently. Now in a big industrial high, high kind of rise fire, obviously they're not going to go to that because that small amount of water is never going to put out a big fire. But on a smaller kind of fire, you'll see a much greater efficiency using lesser amounts of water continuously than just taking gigantic buckets full of water per second and pouring them out over the fire itself. As a result of that inefficiency, we usually see water causes a lot of damage. Water damage is one of the unfortunate side effects of most fires. Even if they get the fire put out, there's considerable water damage caused by the fact that they put the fire out. When the water is coming out quickly, um, as I mentioned, the rate of vaporization decreases because it's just not there long enough to absorb as much heat as it could. When it gets cold outside, the water has a tendency to freeze. And that makes it kind of ineffective because you can't really effectively put out a fire with ice. In class B fires, water is usually ineffective because of density. The burning liquid is less dense than the water, so it just floats on top of the water. And so the water doesn't smother it at all. It does take away some of the energy, but it doesn't trap it away from the oxidizers or anything like that. As a class C firefighter, water is terrible. As any of you with a phone know, water and delicate electronic circuitry do not mix. And water does tend to react with burning metals. So what we're getting at with all of these little notes here we tend to really only see water used when we are talking about class A fires. For class B fires, it's usually ineffective. For class C fires, it might be effective, but it'll also destroy all of the circuitry. Class D fires will actually make them worse. So we, we see these most often with the class A's. So that's water as a fire extinguisher. It's got its good points. It's got its bad points. One of the things that have been done in a lot of firefighting systems 
is the use of foams where a foam can kind of work with some of the disadvantages of water by helping the water the, to stay in place and be a little bit more efficient in its use. And so what happens is basically they put a, a cap on the water hose and it allows the water to flow through this foam and the foam kind of attracts all the water and puts it in the, um, on the fire area. And it kind of keeps everything closer in one spot. So in foam systems, we do get greater efficiencies with water as a fire extinguisher because the water has been kind of trapped in this gel or this foam instead of just flowing out everywhere. There are some different variants of, flow, of foam systems. Um, some are alcohol resistant. Um, the PyroCool fire extinguishing foam has gained a lot of proper of popularity. It is a little bit more on the expensive side, but um, it does not have as near the environmental effects of other kinds of foams um, in terms of uh, leaving behind residues uh, or at least residues that are environmentally uh, unsafe. But again, the thing with the foam is it's we've got a lot of the same properties as water, but we're decreasing the water's fluidity. We're just decreasing the water's ability to kind of just go everywhere and making it stay in one place a little bit better, get a lot greater heat efficiency as a result. So we still have, still have some of the same drawbacks in terms of water damage and other things, but they're going to be lessened by the fact that we don't use as much. So these are examples of portable foam extinguishers. Um, they will usually be given, um, labeling is really important with these. Most of the time you can tell, you know, what kind of fire extinguisher you have by the color of the extinguisher. Um, silver ones like these tend to be kind of special. Um, and so the label here telling us that it is a foam extinguisher. You know, most fire extinguishers are in the red or yellow kind of coloring. Um, but these, uh, chromed ones definitely stick out because they are different and, and usually special as a result. After water. Probably the second most common fire extinguisher that most people think of is the carbon dioxide fire extinguisher, sometimes referred to as a Freon fire extinguisher. Where it is effective is because carbon dioxide is a heavier gas than air. And so when we spray carbon dioxide onto a fire, the carbon dioxide is gonna to sink toward the bottom of the fire rather than rise up. Its primary role is as a choking agent. It is going to separate the fuel and the oxidizer from each other. It is gonna do so because it is more dense than oxygen is as well. So it's more dense than nitrogen, it's more dense than oxygen. It's gonna sink and help to separate the fuel vapor and the oxidizer from each other. And if we can separate the fuel vapor and the oxidizer from each other, we knock out that chain of reaction, take away the oxidizer. It works out pretty well for um, lowering the capability of the fire to continue. Carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are very common. They can be found in handheld kinds of designs. 
They also can be found in fixed systems. So in particular, if you're looking at a firefighting system in an industrial area or in some kind of special workplace area, carbon dioxide fire extinguishers can be found in those areas. Obvious concerns with carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are asphyxiation. Because they are more dense than air, they are more dense than oxygen. Breathing it in in place of oxygen can be of a concern for anyone in the area, including the first responders and the firefighting personnel. So in areas where large amounts of carbon dioxide, especially in fixed systems, that is a, a real concern is, um, did everybody get out of that room okay before the, before the fixed system engaged? Because otherwise you could have a problem where you have someone unconscious because the carbon dioxide basically wiped out the oxygen supply. These are your carbon dioxide fire extinguishers. You can usually tell a carbon dioxide extinguisher from a solid fire extinguisher. The nozzle on the end is usually wider for a carbon dioxide extinguisher because as that freon gas starts to expand and the carbon dioxide starts to come out, it'll want to fan out and that's going to cover a wider area as it comes out of the fire extinguisher. The other fire extinguishers that look like this, these are your solid phase ones. We'll talk about those in a second. And those ones usually have very thin round nozzles because it is shooting out a solid material and you wanna be very targeted and direct with where that goes. Because otherwise it makes a real, real mess. This is an example of a fixed system. So in areas where you might have large amounts of combustible material that are present at elevated temperatures, like a printing press, um, a fire extinguishing system like this is necessary and useful in the event that um, the natural events of the day cause the paper to ignite. Let's move on to now dry chemical extinguishers. Dry chemical extinguishers are the most common extinguishers for household use. If you have a fire extinguisher in your house, and you should, chances are very good that it is a dry chemical fire extinguisher because dry chemical fire extinguishers have the greatest utility of the bunch. They are usually referred to by their classification in terms of which classification of fires can they put out. So BC fire extinguishers, which carbon dioxide is also a BC extinguisher. Um, you don't want to use carbon dioxide on a class A fire because the pressure of that gas flying out of that chute can cause the flammable material, especially if it's paper-based, to just fly everywhere. And it, that, that might not actually put out the fire, might actually cause it to spread. So BC extinguishers include some form of bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate are the most common examples. These ones, their primary advantage is that they will decompose on heating to carbon dioxide. So you have a solid phase material that helps to start choke out the fuel from the oxidizer. And as it heats up, as it absorbs some of that heat, it forms carbon dioxide gas, which is heavier than air, to help continue to provide that barrier between fuel and oxidizer. 
Class D fire extinguishers are usually um, dry chemical as well. These oftentimes will contain graphite or other kinds of materials that um, will more or less form a barrier upon encountering the hot metal um, and, and more or less coat it with um, a non-flammable lubricant. The most common inside fire extinguishers are the ABCs. These include mono uh, ammonium phosphate. The thing with all of these dry chemical extinguishers is that the materials inside are solids and they leave really nasty residues behind. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little story from my, uh, my own college days. Uh, when I was in college, I think I was a sophomore. I was uh, staying in the upperclassmen dorm and um, I was on the floor with a bunch of athletes. Um, our college had a pretty good swim team. And they came back, they had just won the conference championship in swimming and they were having some fun in their room and oh, about two in the morning or so, they decided that they needed to have some fun outside of the room. They took the chemical fire extinguishers from the end of the hall and they just started spraying them around, which set off the smoke detectors and the fire alarms. And so this is the middle of February in Pennsylvania, 2.30 a.m. and the entire dormitory has been evacuated while they figure out what the heck happened on the second floor. It took four hours for the dust to settle on the second floor. I ended up having to sleep in the lobby of our dormitory building until one of my friends on a different floor finally said, just stay on my couch, dude. <laughs> the messy residue, it was like fine snow when we finally got to go back to our dorm, our, our rooms. Just a fine yellowish powder all over the floor. So I don't kid you when I say this stuff leaves a lot of residue. It's really messy and it's very fine. Perfect for fire extinguishing. But after the fire is put out, there's still quite a bit of a mess left behind. So that's always the downside with an ABC fire extinguisher is that there's always going to be a mess. Now, granted, anyone will take that mess. You can vacuum it up. Anyone would take that mess over losing, you know, significant possessions or parts of their house or whatever it might be. But understand that that messy business is always going to be there when we use an ABC extinguisher. As shown by the picture here, this is what an ABC extinguisher looks like. And again, see the difference in that nozzle. For an ABC extinguisher, it is a very thin rubber hose so that you can very directly point that chemical at the fire and not anywhere else. Now, this is how dry chemical extinguishers work. As I mentioned before, the ones that contain bicarbonates, whether they are sodium bicarbonate or potassium bicarbonate, when they are heated, they will form carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, obviously being the same thing that is in the CO2 extinguishers, help to block that, create that barrier between the fuel and the oxidizer to help put the fire out. The fact that they have to be heated to make this means that they will also rob the reaction of some heat as they decompose, which means that that's heat that's unavailable for turning the fuel into more vapor. The reason they work on class B fires, sodium ions, 
we'll react with each other, we'll react with the uh, flammable material, and that will produce water. And the water, as we talked about before, acts as a heat sink and prevents the fuel from forming more vapor to allow the reaction to occur. So we've got class B, class C, and class A to a degree taken care of with those things. The carbon dioxide aspect, and for those flammable liquids, getting this water formation to help rob some of the heat from the reaction itself. For your ABC, these are going to decompose upon heating, just like the bicarbonates do. So we're robbing the reaction of heat. And that decomposition will end up producing ammonia um, from that monoammonium phosphate. And the ammonia can actually react with the flammable liquids to form other materials that are not nearly as flammable. So the primary means for all of our dry chemical is robbing the reaction of its heat. We rob the reaction of its heat. It makes it so that the fuel vapors are unable to continue to form. And eventually the fire just kind of works itself out because there's not enough heat to um, continue the reaction. Two more classes to talk about. First, we've got our dry powder. So for class D fires, I mentioned this before, graphite is the primary ingredient in those dry chemical extinguishers. What happens there is the graphite reacts with the metal. We end up getting a metallic carbide as a result, the metallic carbide will react with water and form um, less reactive, less dangerous kinds of things. Um, and so that's why we can't use water on these kinds of fires. We put the dry chemical on them. Dry chemical produces a carbide. The carbide is not flammable unless we dump water on it. So we just keep water out of it. And then finally, we have our class Ks. Class Ks are, are only examples of wet chemical agents. The wet chemical agents include usually some kind of basic material like lye, or potash. And what happens here is we get a saponification reaction. Saponification is a soap making reaction. So what happens is if you're familiar at all with kind of the old time way of making soap, you take a hot fat material you get it up to a boiling kind of temperature, and then you hit it with base, usually lye, 
and you'll start to get the fat to clump up into these solid pieces that eventually you press together and you form and it makes a soap. If you're familiar at all with the movie Fight Club, that's kind of the process that is used and that's, there's a whole other thing about, about a lie with, with that particular movie. But the idea is by creating these soaps, we effectively do two things. A, we take away a lot of the heat because a lot of the energy gets sucked out of that. And we turn the boiling fat into this solid material that is not flammable. Now, usually this works within a fixed system. Uh, I thought I had a video here. It got taken down apparently. Um, but I was talking about the stuff that happens in those, uh, in those commercial fryers, those big um, nozzles that are above fryers. If you ever look closely, you know, next time you go to a fast food restaurant, take a peek into the kitchen, you'll see these nozzles above the fryer areas and those shoot out the lye in the event of a fire. And it puts out the fire pretty much instantaneously. Now there is a commercial version of this that is handheld. Again, you can see here it's in a silver fire extinguisher as opposed to a red one because it is different and we wanna visually monitor that. But folks, that is the end of chapter five. So again, homework and quiz are due next Wednesday, but if you have no questions here, call today. I'll see you on Friday.